Hello, anatomy colleagues. It is Dr. Alsup, and we are going to continue our discussion of the bones of the upper limb, and we will focus on the bone of the arm, as well as the two bones of the forearm. So, as you can see, there are quite a few structures that we want to start to understand conceptually where they are located, as well as some of the reasons why I want you to know these structures. So, is anything attaching there? Is it forming a joint? Uh, is there any neurovasculature associated with that region? So, we'll talk through some of those as we make our way through the separate bones. Okay, so we will start with the humerus. The humerus is going to be a paired bone, so you'll have a right and a left humerus, and it will be the uh, bone of the arm. So you will only have one bone here, unlike with the, the paired bones that you have in the forearm. And so we're going to work on uh, this proximal portion of the arm and some of the structures that we want you to be able to identify. And we'll start with the head of the humerus. And this is going to be the ball of that is going to articulate with the socket at the glenohumeral or the shoulder joint. And recall our conversation when we were talking about the, the scapula and we looked at that glenoid fossa or the glenoid cavity and how shallow it was. And you have this relatively bulbous head that is fitting into that pretty shallow cavity. And so you don't have that great of a fit between the the ball and the socket allowing for considerable more, more, more mobility, but that also um, on the other side will indicate there's going to be less stability at the glenohumeral joint in comparison to some of the others. And the head, similar to any uh, of the other articular surfaces, will be nice and smooth because of the articular cartilage that sat there during life. Now just um, right at the edge of where it's nice and smooth and before you get to the tubercles you will have the anatomical neck all right so kind of uh, right just distal to the head and um, what this is is a true neck so you'll you'll generally have a neck in a lot of the long bones particularly those that have a head associated with it and it's basically just a, a area that's slightly pinched in in comparison to the head. So you have an anatomical neck with the humerus, but you also have another structure that is referred to as the surgical neck. And we'll come back to these tubercles in a moment, but the, there are these um, mostly palpable, particularly with the greater tubercle structures. And just distal to the tubercles, you will have one of the narrowest portions of the bone, and this is called the surgical neck. So it's still in the proximal humerus, but it's distal to the head as well as the greater and lesser tubercles. And it's named the surgical neck because it is a clinically important area, which is a common site of fracture. Anytime that you have a, a portion of the bone that tends to be smaller, or um, less robust than some of the other areas, it's generally more likely uh, to fracture than, say, the, the more bulbous portions of the proximal uh, humerus. And it's also important, too, because right around here, you will have the axillary nerve that will kind of wrap around, particularly this posterior portion of the surgical neck. So if you think you had a fracture right here, and you had a nerve traveling right there, it not only would affect the bone, as you would assume a fracture would, but it could feasibly, those fractured ends could feasibly cause a, a cut or some type of uh, damage to that axillary nerve. And we'll talk about this in more detail when we get to the muscles, but the axillary nerve is going to be the main supply of the deltoid muscle, which is kind of that shoulder cap muscle right sitting right on top of your shoulder region so if you have um, the axillary nerve that is damaged that could directly affect uh, how or if the deltoid can contract 
All right, returning to the, the tubercle, so we're still in this proximal area of the humerus, you're going to have a greater tubercle, which is going to be lateral in comparison to the more medial head. So I always say the greater tubercle is opposite to the head. The head will always be medial, greater tubercle will always be lateral. In fact, you can palpate your greater tubercle on that lateral portion of your upper arm. It is called the greater tubercle because it is larger than the lesser tubercle, and that is because you have more muscles attaching to the greater tubercle than what you have on the lesser. So you have three out of the four rotator cuff muscles attaching here. And it makes sense that rotator cuff muscles would attach in this general region because this is going to play a big role in terms of the shoulder joint. So uh, remember that tubercles, processes, etc. are going to be formed by those uh, muscles or ligaments that attach there. And if there's going to be more force associated with the tendons um, of more muscles, that would make that portion of the bone larger. The lesser tubercle is only visible on the anterior side of the humerus. You do not see it here on this posterior view. And it will be anteriorly projecting. It is much more difficult to palpate. And you will only have one of the four rotator cuff muscles attaching here. And it will be the subscapularis. And we will um, we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the muscles. All right, so just a real quick review. Greater tubercle is lateral. Lesser tubercle is anterior. And in between those two structures, so in between the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle, you will have a divot or a sulcus that runs right in between those two structures. And it's actually quite pronounced, and we'll see that on some of the uh, actual dry bone images when we get to the laboratory, laboratory portion. But it is going to be a fairly significant sulcus between those tubercles. You all have the latissimus dorsi uh, distal attachment is going to be right on the floor of the sulcus. And you'll also have the long head of the biceps tendon kind of running up through that region on its way to attaching uh, or having its attachment on the scapula. All right. Now we are moving distally, and if I return back to this picture, I should have uh, kind of added that back. Distal, I'm meaning um, on the distal portion, close, closer to the forearm. We are going to have two structures um, that are going to be right or just proximal to the condylar portion. So the condylar portion is going to be the smooth area down here, so it's actually articulating with bone. And then on either side, you're going to have, just above that, two projections. You'll have the medial epicondyle, which is considerably more prominent than the lateral epicondyle. And if you just kind of feel on your own arm, if you're in the elbow region, and you palpate the most medial portion uh, around your elbow, you'll feel a fairly prominent um, projection, and that is the medial epicondyle, whereas on the other side, the opposite side, the lateral epicondyle is certainly palpable, it's just not as large. And you can see here, we're looking at an image, this is going to be the forearm region. This is going, you can see a little peak of the medial epicondyle right here. A lot of the muscles, the flexor muscles on the anterior portion we have palmar view here, but that also means anterior. So these anterior forearm muscles or flexor muscles are going to, a lot of these will have a proximal attachment on that medial epicondyle. Whereas if you're over on this side or on the posterior side or the dorsal view, a lot of those muscles, these extensor muscles, or these posterior forearm muscles will have an attachment on the lateral epicondyle. And so we'll return to these muscles, obviously, in considerable detail. There are a lot, and I mean a lot, of muscles associated with the forearm. Um, and while we have a, a similar amount on the extensor size, side, the flexors are typically a bit more powerful. 
And so that would have a, a lot to do with the fact that the medial epicondyle is going to be larger. One other thing that I have here in the bullet point next to the medial epicondyle is running just posterior to the medial epicondyle will be a very important nerve that is going to play a big role in terms of innervating the muscles of the hand, and that is the ulnar nerve. And you can even, if you really wanted to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest getting too, uh, too frisky with this area right here, but if you, if you palpate just posterior to your medial epicondyle, you could feel your ulnar nerve. And the reason I put this here is two reasons. You could have a fracture of the medial epicondyle, and that could directly affect the ulnar nerve. But really, the main reason I put it here is because, have you ever heard of the funny bone? Hitting your funny bone? Well, what you're doing is you're hitting, or you're kind of pinging that ulnar nerve at, at its close proximity to the medial epicondyle. So that's what that is. You often feel it quite a bit. Um, in your hand region when you hit that funny bone. You kind of feel that weird sensation in your hand because it's going to provide a lot of that sensory innervation in that region. So that is um, one of those myths busted ulnar nerve is really that funny bone, right, with this close relationship to the medial epicondyle. I love the epicondyles. I'm going to come back to it again. Uh, you can't talk about these forearm muscles without talking about the epicondyle, so they will come back for sure. Okay, continuing with the distal portion, like I had here, um, I had mentioned that this general area right here, so you see this smooth portion of the bone, is overall referred to as the condylar region of the humerus. But really, we can separate this condylar region into two parts. You will have the capitulum and the trochlea. The capitulum is going to be the articulation. Um, it's, the capitulum will articulate with the head of the radius. So this is the part that's articulating with the radius, whereas the trochlea, or this more, more spool-shaped um, articular portion will articulate with the ulna. And it's really this articulation with the ulna that's playing the biggest role in terms of the elbow joint. So dependent on if the elbow is fully extended or fully flexed, it will depend on uh, where that trochlear notch is and um, so forth around the trochlea. All right, the last thing I want to um, note in terms of the humerus is the olecranon fossa. And you can only see the olecranon fossa on the posterior portion of the humerus. It's this large, um, fairly deep fossa that will accommodate the olecranon, which is this large portion of the ulna. ulna. It will accommodate that full olecranon uh, into this fossa region during full extension of the elbow joint. So if you think about having your arm fully, or excuse me, your forearm fully extended, that olecranon is fitting in almost perfectly into this olecranon fossa. Whereas if you flex your elbow or flex your forearm, it kind of moves out of the olecranon fossa. Okay, now moving on to the two forearm bones, we will have the ulna and the radius. And the ulna is the one that is longer. Key for me always remembering is that it is the more medial of the forearm bones. It plays a big role in terms of stabilization, and that has a lot to do with the fact that it's going to be the major player in terms of the elbow joint. And you can see um, this is going to be more proximal, and this will be more distal. So the proximal portion of the ulna is considerably larger than what you have in this fairly wimpy distal portion of the ulna. And like I said, it's because the ulna is playing a bigger role in terms of the elbow joint, whereas it plays a minimal, almost no role in terms of the wrist joint, which will be kind of the flip side when we're talking about the radius. 
So focusing on these more proximal portions of the ulna, here is that olecranon that we said would fit into the olecranon fossa of the humerus. Sometimes you hear it just olecranon, sometimes you see it olecranon process. It is very posterior, it is that point of the elbow, so that thing that you can palpate on the back of your elbow. And it's large, it's very robust, and that has a lot to do with the fact that you have a pretty huge muscle that is going to have its distal attachment there, which is the triceps brachii. And triceps brachii is that large three-headed muscle on the back of your arm. So big, important in terms of extension of the elbow. Okay, the coronoid process is going to be this projection right here. It is going to be more anteriorly projecting, which makes sense because we knew this um, olecranon process is going to be posterior. And I'm going to put this as proximal, not posterior, whereas this is distal. But it all is kind of uh, posterior as well, whereas this would be more anterior. Okay, so that coronoid process is anteriorly projecting. It's going to kind of be the end or the, the more inferior portion of the trochlear notch. But importantly, you're going to have a very important flexor of the forearm attaching here, the brachialis. A lot of times that biceps brachii gets a lot of the glory, but it's really that brachialis that's just deep to biceps brachii that's the workhorse for flexion. And then lastly, this notch right here is that trochlear notch, and that's what articulates with the trochlea of the humerus. So you can see and kind of imagine with flexion and extension of the elbow, that trochlear notch kind of, wrote, kind of moving around that trochlea of the humerus. All right, two more structures we want to note. One's proximal and one's distal. There's a smooth area right here that is on the more lateral side of the ulna. So we're looking at a lateral view here. So you can see this radial notch really well. And what is going to fit there or articulate there, because it's nice and smooth, so we know something is likely articulating there, is the head of the radius. And you can see what that looks like right here. And so we have that humeral ulnar joint, which is what we think of as the elbow joint, but you also will have this, the radius and the ulna articulating in many different areas. So this radial, between the radial notch and the head of the humerus is going to be the proximal radial ulnar joint. Then you're going to have this joint, this interosseous membrane, or the syndesmosis between the bodies or the shafts, and then you'll have a distal radial ulnar joint um, at this, for, uh, this more distal portion. So you have three different joints associated with the radius and ulna. Also on um, this uh, less, um, less complex or less robust distal portion of the ulna, you'll have this little bitty extension of the ulna referred to as the styloid process. And you saw, you see here that I have ulnar in parentheses because there are multiple styloid processes in the body. Remember, we had one way up in the skull of the temporal bone. So it's nice to be specific when you're talking about uh, structures that are found in multiple areas. All right, on to the radius. The radius is, key here is it is lateral. So I, I love and want you to make sure that you understand that the radius is lateral, the ulna is medial, and think about how that would be when you're in anatomical position. So remember that palm is facing forward, and so the lateral portion, um, your radius will be there and your ulna will be there, and they're not rotating along one another. And so that's an important thing, and we'll get to that when we talk about uh, the joints in a bit more detail. But at this point, just make sure you understand that the radius is the lateral bone in the forearm. You have this really kind of cute head of the radius that will articulate with not only the capitulum of the humerus, but with that radial notch of the ulna. And then another important thing I want you to note here is this bump on this proximal portion 
uh, referred to as the radial tuberosity. And this is going to be medially projecting, just distal to the head. This right here would be the neck of the radius. But then you have this uh, fairly noticeable tuberosity here, and that is because this is going to be the distal attachment site for the biceps brachii. Now, you can have numerous types of fractures associated with these bones, um, but one of the more common fractures is going to be on the distal end of the radius, and this is referred to as a Coley's fracture. So this is one of the more common fractures. Uh, sometimes uh, you, some people may uh, kind of put this together as a wrist fracture. It's technically more proximal than the wrist, but it is in close proximity because these are these carpal bones here. And typically it's a complete transverse fracture. So you're kind of going the, the, the whole way through the distal end. It's very often um, caused by a, uh, a, a forceful extension of the hand and so I love this you may hear this if you ever go into a clinical field Coley's fractures are often caused by foosh, foosh, which is falling on an outstretched hand and that is a very typical um, thing that people do when they fall they're trying to protect their head so they put out their hand really quickly and then they can fall on that outstretched hand but that can have implications. It can have implications on the carpal bones. It can have implications on the distal radius. Sometimes that force is transmitted proximally. It can get all the way up to the clavicle and cause fractures there as well. So while this is a very typical um, thing that we do, and that's to protect the head and that precious, precious brain in there, it does have implications, particularly in individuals that are going to be um, uh, of older age and uh, if there is any advanced osteoporosis, because there's a lot of spongy bone in this area, so this particular area could be weaker. And you have this very um, uh, typical presentation of this posterior projection of this region. So you can see that that just doesn't look quite right, and that's because that radius, or that fractured portion of the radius typically, will extend posteriorly. So you'll have that kind of, sometimes people refer to this as the dinner fork um, uh, deformity. Okay, so that was the humerus and the radius and the ulna. Let's do one quick review here before moving on to the bones of the wrist as well as the hand. So the olecranon fossa of the humerus articulates with which forearm bone? Is it the radius or is it the ulna? And right here, so we're thinking about which bone will articulate with the humerus. Well, we know both of these bones will. One will articulate a little bit more so than the other. And I think this is really kind of the telling thing here. The olecranon fossa is going to articulate with the olecranon or the olecranon process. So you need to understand which, two, which one of these bones has the olecranon process associated with it. And it's the bone that is more complex and larger proximally which is the ulna. So it's the ulna that's playing that bigger role in terms of the elbow joint region. The radius is not going to, um, to have the olecranon. It will articulate with the humerus, but when we're talking about the humeral ulnar joint, really we're, we're focusing more on the, the ulnar portion of that. The radius does play a very big role in terms of the, oops, excuse me, the radiocarpal joint, which we'll talk about in the joints video, but it's the, the main one in terms of the, the wrist region. And that has a lot to do with the fact that you can see proximally it's quite small here, and then it expands distally. So it can articulate with a lot of those carpal bones. All right, that was a lot of fun. As you review these structures, and we'll kind of go over these again more in terms of how you're going to be able to identify these particular structures in the laboratory videos. But as always, please feel free to reach out to me with any concept questions. I am always happy to talk anatomy. Thank you for your time and attention here, and have a great rest of your day.